On June 4, 2004, a scene of chaos erupted in the small town of Granby, Colorado, as a 60-ton behemoth rampaged through the streets, leveling buildings and sending residents fleeing for their lives. This monster of machinery was a Komatsu D355A crawling dozer, fitted with customized armor and multiple fire ports for various rifles that included a 50 caliber M82. The man inside who'd created this juggernaut and now piloted it on its warpath was Marvin Hemeyer, a local business owner who had lived in Granby for a little over 10 years at the time of this incident. Since the reason Mr. Hemeyer went from small business owner to killing machine builder and pilot is as important a part of today's story as the rampage itself, let's rewind a little bit and go back to the year of 1991. Marvin Hemeyer was an Air Force veteran who grew up in South Dakota and possessed a talent for welding. In the early 1990s, he went to Granby for a two-week vacation and decided to buy property there. Initially, this was more of an investment for a vacation home, but Marvin decided that he liked Granby and moved in permanently. He got a job at a muffler shop and rose through the ranks quickly. He soon realized he was one of, if not the most talented welder in town, and decided that he might as well start a business and be his own boss. He had already run successful businesses in northern Denver and Boulder, Colorado, so it was something that he was experienced in. Marvin's shop became a success and quickly became the go-to spot in Granby if you had a muffler issue. And at this point, everything in Marvin's life seemed to be going perfect. He was well-liked in the community, had a thriving business, a girlfriend whom he frequently traveled across the country with, and a robust social life where he indulged in activities such as snowmobiling. Unfortunately, things weren't as great as they appeared on the surface. The property Marvin had ended up opening his shop on was one in a public auction, where FDIC foreclosed property was being sold. According to Mr. Hemeyer, his purchase of the property had drawn the ire of a local man by the name of Cody Docheff, who owned a concrete company. According to Marvin, Mr. Docheff was so upset that he had been outbid, he went up to Marvin at a bar later that day and started screaming at him. This began a decade-long conflict between Marvin Hemeyer and Cody Docheff that subsequently drew several residents of Granby into it. The one thing Cody Docheff possessed that Marvin Hemeyer didn't, though, was connections. Docheff was good friends with several prominent members of Granby's ruling class, the good old boys club as they were dubbed by Marvin. This group of men held powerful positions on the city council, worked as judges and police chiefs, and members of the zoning board. Soon after Marvin had won his property and came into conflict with Cody Docheff, the problem seemed to start. The property he had purchased didn't have running sewage, and Marvin was required to connect to the city pipeline. However, he was shocked to learn that doing so would cost him an additional $70,000 money that Mr. Hemeyer either didn't have or wasn't willing to spend. He approached the council for the city's sewer district and asked them to subsidize a portion of the cost. The leader of this council was Ron Thompson, a close friend of Cody Docheff. Shockingly, this group declined to offer Marvin assistance for the line, and allegedly during the hearings, Ron Thompson made some very unflattering remarks about Mr. Hemeyer that led Marvin and many of his friends to feel as though this ruling had come at the hands of what was essentially a kangaroo court. To make matters worse for Marvin, Cody Docheff had purchased the property right next to his muffler shop, intending to use it for a concrete plant. Mr. Hemeyer filed a lawsuit to prevent the building of the plant, which further strained the relationship between him and Docheff. Docheff also fired back by refusing to grant permission for Marvin to run sewage pipe through his property, which now meant in order to comply with the city's ruling, he would have to run pipe even further to circumvent Mr. Docheff's property, costing him even more money. Docheff offered to grant Marvin the permission if he dropped the lawsuit, but Mr. Hemeyer refused. 
he elected to just pay the several fines that were now being regularly levied at him, and continued his legal battle to prevent the construction of the concrete plant. The way Marvin and his friends saw it, the powers that be were simply trying to squeeze him out of business because they were upset he had purchased the property in the first place. However, as they say, there are two sides to every story. According to many of those that were involved in these decisions, what happened to Marvin Hemeyer was as far from a corrupt squeeze as it got. In fact, many of them claimed that the city of Granby had bent over backwards to help out Marvin, by forgiving thousands in fines and constantly extending the deadline for him to get within compliance. According to them, the sewage dispute wasn't anything out of the ordinary, and was something that all businesses in the area were required to comply with. The way they saw it, the only thing out of the ordinary was Marvin's behavior and his constant accusations of corruption and wrongdoing without any evidence to back it up. While many of Marvin's friends say he was a gentle and good soul who would do anything to help someone out, others have painted him as a man with a deep-seated anger problem, who easily resorted to violent threats when he didn't get his way or felt wronged, which was basically all of the time. Another interesting piece of evidence pointing to Marvin as an aggressor in all of this was the fact that shortly after purchasing his two-acre property for $42,000, he agreed to sell it to Cody Docheff for an asking price of $225,000, which would have been a substantial profit. After agreeing to the price, Marvin turned around and raised it to $350,000. When Mr. Docheff also agreed to this, Marvin yet again raised it to a million dollars. Basically, Mr. Hemeyer just kept raising his asking price to the point where Docheff had no choice but to say no. The zoning dispute stretched over four years, and after having spent thousands of dollars in legal fees and appealed to every court he could, Mr. Hemeyer had lost and construction of the concrete plant was approved. It was around this time that he begun to make audio logs ranting about the rampant corruption within the city of Granby. It was also around this time that Marvin purchased the Komatsu D-355A that he would later turn into a weapon of war. Originally, he intended to use this to pave a new road to his muffler shop so he could avoid sharing a road with Mr. Docheff's concrete plant. By the early 2000s, Marvin's life was falling apart and he had made a decision. He was going to make the city of Granby and those whom he felt wronged him pay. He began construction on what would become known as the Killdozer. He created a 13-ton set of armor that was made of 12-inch thick concrete covered in steel, with the intention of fastening it to the vehicle. Because the armor would block his vision while driving, he set up a system of cameras that would allow him to see and covered them in bulletproof glass. To avoid dirt and dust blocking the camera lens, he set up compressed air nozzles next to them that he could use to blow the debris away. He then set up multiple fire ports for rifles, allowing him to fire at anyone that got close to him. It was an undeniably impressive piece of construction, whatever your opinion is on Hemeyer himself. On June 4th, 2004, he sealed himself inside of the cockpit of the bulldozer and started his rampage. After busting out the wall of his muffler shop, he systematically took to destroying the property of anyone he'd felt wronged him over the years. Unsurprisingly, his first target was Mr. Docheff's concrete plant right next door. Over the next two hours, he destroyed 13 buildings, which included Granby City Hall, the public library, and the town's newspaper office. Local police responded quickly, but were essentially powerless to stop the vehicle. Everything was tried from small arms fire to dynamite, to even bringing in other pieces of heavy equipment to block its path, none of which was successful. Things became so dire that the National Guard was contacted, but due to Granby's remote location, they would take some time to arrive. After about two hours, the bulldozer had begun to slow down due to damage it sustained throughout the rampage. 
The radiator had blown and the smoke was making it difficult for Marvin to now see outside of the vehicle. He turned and began to take out a hardware store that was owned by one of the city council members who had voted against him over the years. While destroying the sidewall, the bulldozer fell into the basement of the building and became stuck. Police quickly moved in and blocked any potential exits and waited. Inside of the vehicle, Marvin, now realizing his revenge spree had come to an end, retrieved a pistol he had brought with him and turned it on himself. It is likely that Marvin Hemeyer never intended to leave his creation alive, as the way the armor was constructed did not allow the person inside to exit the cabin once they had climbed in. By the time all was said and done, the city of Granby had sustained over $4 million in damage, but miraculously, no one was killed. It didn't take long for neighbors to ascertain the motives behind the rampage. In fact, while it was still going on, a friend had called into a Colorado news station and told them the reason for the attack before Marvin's identity had even been revealed. Friends of Marvin say that he was a good man pushed to his limit by a corrupt system that was unjustly trying to ruin him. This viewpoint is shared by many who view Mr. Hemeyer as a hero who stood up to government corruption. Others paint him as a sick man who was easy to anger and created illusions of victimization in his head so he could justify his incredibly dangerous attack on Granby. In my opinion, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I don't think it is very accurate to call Marvin Hemeyer a hero. He did something incredibly destructive that put countless people in danger. Sure, no one was killed in the rampage, but it wasn't for lack of trying on his part. So I think painting him as some benevolent avatar of justice who just wanted to destroy the property of local officials is a bit naive. On the other hand though, I don't think any rational person can look at the series of events leading up to Marvin's rampage and not see there was definitely some foul play by Granby's local government. And those who claim Granby was just this sweet old small town paradise where everyone worked hard and treated each other with respect are probably intentionally or unintentionally lying. I definitely think Marvin was treated unfairly, but he was also more of an aggressor in this story than he painted himself as. I'll leave you to form your own opinion. Comment below and let us know what you think about Marvin Hemeyer. Was he a good man pushed to his limit as so many claim? or an avatar of his own destruction. I look forward to seeing what you guys think. Thanks a lot for watching and we will see you all next time.